and here's another one on even a bigger box, 120 core machine pegged at 100%. And I'm hoping by showing you these queries, you'll be able to figure out what's going on and, and not see this as often, or hopefully never. So I started doing this stuff a few years ago, and this became possible when SQL Server 2005 came out because they introduced DMV queries to the product. And each new version of SQL Server adds new DMV queries and new columns to existing ones. And they give you a lot of really useful information about your hardware, missing indexes, top weights, your most expensive queries from lots of different perspectives. And most of these are really lightweight and they're very easy to use. You do have to have view server state permission to use them. And also keep in mind that the information that they're collecting is not persisted between restarts. So what you can do if you want to is you can write some of the more useful metrics to some user database so you can have some history and trending information. And I've got a server monitor database that you can download for free. It's a script that creates it along with an agent job that collects some metrics once a minute. And that's really easy to extend to pick up more information. So if you follow that link, you can get to that. It's on my blog from a couple years ago. So anyway, here's the history of these diagnostic queries. I first started putting out in the public back in April 2009, and I've got separate versions of these for each major SQL Server version since 2005. And I recently reorganized the order of these for the active versions of SQL Server, so 2012 through 2016. So anyways, every month I update these and I have them up on my blog and they're completely free. I'm not trying to sell you anything here. So you just need to go out there and download them. So that's pretty much it. I want to really rush through this because I want to get to the actual fun part of showing you the queries. So let me get over to SQL Server here. And this is what the queries look like. And this is the January 2016 version for SQL Server 2014. And I have lots of links in here to knowledge base articles and white papers and things like that that you'll see throughout the queries. And this is for my own good as well as other people's because I use these on a daily basis with my customers. So that's one reason why they keep getting better over time. But what you'll notice is that I have an introductory query that's trying to make sure you're on the right version of SQL Server because I get a lot of emails where people say, oh, the queries don't work. And a lot of times it's because they're trying to run the 2014 version on SQL Server 2008, for example. So this tries to catch that. But what you'll notice after that is each query has an introductory header that sort of describes it, and then a number, and then a short description inside of parentheses here. And I put those in there because there's people out there around the world who have written PowerShell scripts and C-sharp executables to parse this stuff and run it automatically and collect the results. So I do all that to make it easier for them. But here's the actual query, query number one. And what this is doing is getting your version information. So this shows you your server name, and then it gives you add app version, which shows you the version of SQL Server and the addition of SQL Server and the exact build number. <clears throat> and they also recently enhanced this, <clears throat> excuse me, to show you the service pack and CU level right in here, along with the knowledge base article that it describes that CU. So this tells me a lot of useful information about what is running on your instance, you know, what version, what edition, and how old the build is. And I have a build chart here below that shows you, you know, the RTM branch on the left, and now we have the SP1 branch on the right. And I'm on 4436, which is the latest service pack in CU. And then down below here, I have links to some useful articles. And this one right here is a really good white paper, by the way, that has trace flags and other configuration options and Microsoft things that you should set to get the high performance on heavy duty workloads. And I was involved in, in writing and editing that and it's a very good resource in my opinion. So moving on, the second one is core counts. And this is something that was added in SQL Server 2012 where they write a message to the error log that tells you what SQL Server can see as far as sockets and physical cores and logical processors. So it helps you understand your licensing situation and also helps you detect if you've got an issue where you've installed SQL Server Standard Edition on a great big box and that box has more cores than Standard Edition supports. And SQL Server Standard Edition with SQL Server 2008 R2 and newer is limited to 
four sockets or 16 physical cores, whichever is lower. So I've had a lot of customers who didn't realize that and they installed standard edition on a great big machine and they're only using 16 cores and it's not even spread evenly across their NUMA nodes. So this will help you spot that. All right, moving on, the next one calls the server property built-in function to get a bunch of useful information about your instance. And what you'll notice is these queries start off at the instance level and they go into some hardware and storage stuff and then at sort of halfway through we drill into an individual database to get more information about a particular database. So anyways, this shows you the name of your server and whether it's a named instance or not and whether it's clustered or not and a lot of other good stuff. And some of this stuff here is new where they show you the CU level again and the build number and some other interesting stuff like your collation. So all this kind of stuff shows up right there. And again, the scenario here is you're going into a new job as a DBA and there's a bunch of strange SQL servers there that you don't know anything about and you want to find out what kind of shape they're in and what you need to maybe change. So this stuff is going to help you figure that out. So the next one, query number three, is going to show us the instance level configuration values for the instance. And depending on what version of SQL Server you have, you're going to have a different number of rows here. We've got 70 in SQL Server 2014. And there's certain ones that I tend to focus on, like backup checksum default, which is a new one for SQL Server 2014 that should be enabled. Backup compression default is another one that I think should be enabled in most cases. Also, I want to look at cost threshold for parallelism. The default value for that is five, and that's basically how expensive a query has to be before it gets parallelized. And for a lot of workloads, that's too low. It's pretty common to raise that to a higher value to make things work better on OLTP workloads especially. Next one I tend to focus on is max degree of parallelism. And the default for that is zero, but there's certain cases where you might want to change that to a different value. Uh, the next one is max server memory. And I've got that set to 8,000 on purpose for demo purposes because I've got more memory than that on my workstation here. And then finally, the last one that I always look at is right here, optimize for ad hoc workloads. And I think that should always be enabled. That was added way back in SQL Server 2008. And it helps you reduce the amount of memory that's used by the ad hoc and prepared plan cache a little bit. It doesn't completely solve the problem, but it's really a good idea to have it turned on. So, and again, I've got this all called out in the comments. The next one is DBCC trace status, negative one, and that's going to show me all the global trace flags that are in effect on this instance. And these three that are enabled here, I think, should be enabled on pretty much every single instance. 1118 changes how tempdb works and makes it work a little bit better. 2371 reduces the auto update statistics threshold from 20% to a much lower value that gets lower as the table gets larger. And then 3226 uh, eliminates writing a, a log message to the SQL Server error log every time you have a successful database backup. Now, Microsoft actually agrees, and these two, 1118 and 2371, will be turned on by default in SQL Server 2016 but 3226 is not at that point yet, but I think it's a good idea to have it turned on. All right, the next one, we want to see what's going on with SQL Server's usage of memory right here. So we're looking at process memory. And rather than looking at task manager, you want to look here. So this is how much memory SQL Server is actually using. Also, I can tell whether or not lock pages is in memory is enabled. Since it's zero, it's not. And then I come over here and look at these two flags, process physical memory low and process virtual memory low. You want those to be zero, and they will be in most cases. This is basically SQL Server's view of memory usage. Now the next one, query number seven, is SQL Server services information. And this tells me all some interesting stuff about the service accounts from this instance. I get the process IDs for these processes the startup type, the fact that they're running, and this one's really important, the last startup time for the database engine. This tells me how long SQL Server's been running, and that's really important when you interpret some of the results of the later queries in the set. It also shows you the service account for these, and then it tells you whether or not you're clustered or not, so I'm not on my workstation. All right, moving along, the next one, get the SQL Server agent jobs and category information. 
So this shows you all your SQL Server agent jobs. And you might notice I've got the Ola Hallengren scripts in here, which are a really good solution for a lot of people. And it gives you the description of the job, the job owner, which would be SA rather than an individual logon. And then it tells you whether or not the job's enabled, whether you've got a notify email operator set up or not, and what their email is set up for, and then the category of the jobs, and then the next run date and next run time. So that gives you a quick overview of all your agent jobs. The next one in the set is SQL Server agent alert information. And these are different from agent jobs. And a lot of DBAs don't seem to realize that agent alerts even exist. But what these are is you can create alerts that will detect when certain kinds of errors or other problems occur. And rather than just having it go to the error log, where you might not notice it for a while, when one of these errors occurs, you can have the alert fire and do something like run an agent job or send an email or send a text to your smartphone so you find out sooner rather than later. And I actually have a script on my blog right here that if you download and run that script, it'll create all these agent jobs for you, including the name of your server. So it's pretty neat. I use it all the time myself. All right, the next one in the set is query number 10, and it's Windows information. And this tells me some more information about the operating system I'm running on. And unfortunately, the information that comes out of this is a little bit cryptic. So you get a number for the Windows release, and then the service pack, and the SKU, and the language version. So I have a little chart below that helps you decode that. So since I'm on Windows 6.1, it's either Windows 7, or Windows Server 2008 R2. You can't actually tell from just 6.1. And then you can look at the Windows SKU codes here and figure out if you're on Standard Edition or Enterprise Edition. And then 1033 is US English for the language. All right. The next one in the set is SQL Server NUMA node information. And NUMA stands for Non-Uniform Memory Access. And when you've got more than one physical socket in a server, you typically have a NUMA node. And there's also something else called soft NUMA that's sort of related to this, but this is hardware NUMA. And so since I just have a desktop, I have one NUMA node, and I've got eight schedulers here. So this will help you both with physical machines and virtual machines to see how the VM was set up, for example. All right, the next one, this is looking at the operating system memory and what is going on with that. So when I run this query, this shows me I've got 32 gigs of RAM on my box, and about 20 gigs is available. And here's some information about the page file, which is really not that important, to be honest. But what is important is right here, system memory state. And you want this to say available physical memory is high. The other alternative is available physical memory is steady or available physical memory is low. And you don't want to see either one of those because that means the operating system is under memory pressure. And that means you're under external memory pressure from SQL Server's perspective, and that's really bad. And the way you prevent that from happening is make sure to set your max server memory low enough so that you're not pressuring the operating system. All right. These next three queries are not that interesting if you don't have a clustered in instance, but this will show you where the SQL Server failover cluster diagnostic log is and also all your other logs. So this tells me it's on my C drive and how it's configured. Uh, the next one on the set is if I had a cluster, this would show me all my nodes and then what their status was and who owned the instance. And since I don't have a cluster here, it comes back blank. And then the next one is if I had always on availability groups on a cluster, this would show me what was going on with the quorum type and, and its quorum state, but I don't have that on this here either. All right, the next one here, since I'm a hardware guy, is one of my favorite ones. This is hardware information from SQL Server 2014. And so this tells me I've got one physical CPU, my hyperthread ratio is eight, and so my logical CPU count is eight. And unfortunately, this query doesn't know the difference between an eight-core processor and a quad-core processor with hyper-threading. You can't tell that. You just know that the OS can see eight CPUs. And it shows you how much memory you have also. And it also tells you when SQL Server started it and then the virtual machine type. And a lot of people get confused by this column because if it says hypervisor, that just means there's 
means there's a hypervisor running on your host. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily running inside of that hypervisor as a VM. So if you see hypervisor here, it probably means you're running inside of a VM, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. And there's other ways to find that out, which you'll see shortly. So the next one on the set, I really hate that I have to do this, but I'm going to read the error log with an extended store procedure and figure out the manufacturer and model number of this server. And this is a machine that I built from parts, so it comes back blank. But if it was a Dell or an HP server or laptop, it would come back with the manufacturer and the model number for this server. And then you would be able to look that up and figure out, oh, yeah, it's a two-socket or a four-socket server, and it's five years old or it's six months old. So it's really good to know that information. The next one on the set is even more hacky, and I really wish that Microsoft would put these into actual DMVs, but this is going to read the registry and figure out the processor description. So now I know when I do this that I've got an Intel Core i7-3770K and its base clock speed is 3.5 gigahertz. So that's good to know because either you're a geek like me and you know what this means right off the top of your head or you can look it up. You can Google that model number and it'll take you the Intel Arc database and tell you all the specs for that processor and how old it is. And that's really important to know if you're a SQL Server DBA. And I've got some links here to CPU-Z and some articles I've written about processor selection for SQL Server because it's a really important topic that far too many DBAs just ignore. All right, the next one on the set is buffer pool extensions. And that's a new feature they added to SQL Server 2014 that lets you set aside some space in your file system for a buffer pool file that will cache clean pages. And so the scenario for this is imagine you've got a SAN with magnetic storage and that SAN has relatively bad random read I.O. performance and you have an OLTP workload. And the idea is that you can set aside some space which has to be at least as large as what your max server memory setting is where a SQL Server can cache clean pages there, and then the next time it wants to look for those, if it doesn't find them in your actual real buffer pool, it'll look in this cache file before it goes back out to the storage subsystem. And if you do this with local flash memory that's really fast, this can help performance in some scenarios. But Microsoft doesn't check to see whether it's flash storage or what it, how it performs. They'll let you put this on a thumb drive. And I've seen some cases where this actually hurts performance, and it's only really interesting with standard edition. If you have enterprise edition, you're better off just to get more memory for the machine unless it's maxed out already. So anyways, this shows me that it's enabled and where it is and how big it is. So I've got a 64 gigabyte cache file on my L drive, which is a flash drive on my workstation. So once you know whether or not it's enabled or not, then you can run this query to find out if it's actually being used. And it's kind of difficult to get SQL Server to use this naturally unless you do some funny things like turn your max server memory down to a fairly low value and then hit your machine really hard. So I was able to do that and get it to use this file a little bit so you can see what databases have some data out there in that cache file. All right, the next one in this set, query number 21, is going to tell me uh, if I've had any SQL Server memory dumps. And you don't want to see any memory dumps because a memory dump occurs when SQL Server is having some problems that are just short of crashing completely. And when that happens, it'll write the memory dump out and it'll show you where it is and when it happened and how big it is. And if you're really good with a Windows debugger, you can crack open that file and figure out what might have happened. But for mere mortals like me, I'm going to open a support ticket with Microsoft probably and have them look at it, although there's a text file that comes along with it that will often give you the answer without having to crack open the actual dump file. So you don't want to see any results there. Now the next one on this set is database file names and paths. So this is going to show me all the databases on this instance and where they're located by file. So I've got some on my C drive and some files on my L drive and then down here I've got tempdb on a T drive, and it shows you how many tempdb data files you have. And so this is very useful, and it kind of shows you how your files are laid out across your file system. 
And it also tells you things like are you using percent growth, which is really, really bad. And this is on one of the system databases, I believe. Yeah, MSDB. And also what your growth increment is set up to, and then how big these files are. So this is really nice when you've got lots of databases on an instance to understand how they're laid out and how that's going to affect your I.O. subsystem. All right, the next one, this is going to show me the volume information for all the LUNs or mount points that have any SQL Server or database files. And by that I mean log files or data files, not backup files. So I've got stuff on my C drive, L, and T, and this tells me what file system I have and the logical and volume name, how big they are, and then how much space they have available. Now obviously you don't want to run out of space because then you have a big problem just because you can't grow any files, but also, if you are low on space, that affects your performance, both with magnetic drives and with flash storage. So getting low on space is really bad for several reasons, and this helps you see that really easily. All right, the next one is a query that I stole from Jimmy May and reformatted it a little bit, but this gives you your drive level latency for all of the drives where you have SQL Server database files and it shows you the read latency in microseconds and the write latency and then the overall latency and this is fairly high here and the reason for that is because I was doing some things to really stress out my server before I started this talk but this includes everything that touches your database files so your regular workload things like index maintenance things like backups things like high availability activity like uh, transactional replication or database mirroring always of on availability groups that are reading your log files. So all that stuff is included since SQL Server has been running. <clears throat> and the reason I could point this out is that these numbers are going to be higher than you're going to see in Windows Perfon, and they'll definitely be higher than what your SAND administrator is going to see. But still, this shows you, if you see really high numbers here, it'll point out, oh, it's on the C drive or the T drive or whatever the case may be. Now the next one uses that same DMV virtual file stats and drills into the file level. So now we can see for all of my database files, the data files and the log files, what's going on with the read latency and the write latency. And it shows you how big the files are. And then it also goes over here and tells you things like how many reads and how many writes and how many megabytes have been read and written. And then the last two columns Resource Governor in SQL Server 2014 lets you control I.O. So if you had Resource Governor enabled, this would show you the effect that Resource Governor was having on each one of these files. So this is a really useful query when you're getting ready to have that conversation with your SAN administrator. And they say, oh, there's nothing wrong with the SAN. It looks fine to me. And you can show them SQL Server's view of the world with these queries here. Now, the next one in the set is reading the SQL Server error log, the last five error logs, and it's looking for those 15 second I.O. warnings that you do not want to see. And whenever SQL Server takes more than 15 seconds to complete an I.O., it writes an error message in the error log. And if you see those, that's a sign that you're having pretty severe I.O. issues. And if you see those, you want to look and see if there's any kind of a pattern. Is it always happening at 3 a.m.? when you're rebuilding your indexes or running DBCC check DB? Is it always happening on a certain day of the week? Or is it just all over the place? And it just happens a lot. And that just means your IO subsystem is really performing poorly. And it's pretty hard for anybody to deny that there's an issue when you're seeing lots of 15 second IO warnings. All right, the next one is gonna show me the database properties for all the databases on the instance. So when I run this, it tells me the name of the database and the recovery model and the containment description. And what's really important is the log reuse weight description. If you're in full recovery model, you need to pay attention to that because if there's a problem with replication or database mirroring or a long running transaction, it'll show up here and then you'll see your logs start to fill up and grow. And you know, you may find yourself with what's called a runaway transaction log where you've got something that's preventing the log from being reused and that's going to be a problem if you don't figure out what it is and fix it. You also want to pay, especially with SQL Server 2014 and newer, close attention to the database compatibility level. If it's set to 120, then you're using the new cardinality estimator unless you've overridden it with a trace flag or a query hint. And that 
usually performs better, but occasionally it performs terribly. And certain queries just do really, really bad with that. So you need to be aware of that and just check into it. And then the page verify option should always, always be checksum. And then a bunch of other database properties about statistics. And one that's kind of a pet peeve of mine is auto date statistics asynchronously. I think that should be turned on for most people. It's not on by default. And it's really helpful in my opinion. It prevents having to wait for a statistics update when it happens automatically. And there's other things here like is RSCSI on. And then finally, make sure you don't have auto close on or auto shrink on. Those are both really evil for SQL Server. But lots of stuff here. And I keep adding more stuff as you have newer versions of SQL Server, more database properties show up here, like data delayed durability, which is new for 2014. Okay, the next one in the set, missing indexes for all databases by index advantage. And this query is really, really useful, but it's also very easy to reuse, to misuse, I should say, because a lot of novice DBAs and a lot of developers will run this and then they lose their minds and they want to you know, create a new index for everything that shows up in this query. And that's usually a really bad idea. You're going to over-index your tables if you do that. And what you want to look at when you're interpreting this is when the last user seek was. Was it a few seconds ago or a few minutes ago or was it two or three weeks ago? Because it was a long time ago, that means it's probably just some ad hoc query or seldom run reporting query that maybe is not that important for your normal workload. You also want to look at this index advantage number, but keep in mind, how long has your instance been running? Has it been running just for a day or two or a few hours, or has it been running for six months? Because if it's been running for a long time, these numbers are going to get bigger over time. But if it's only been running for an hour or two or a day or two, and you see big numbers here, that's usually pretty significant. Next thing I look at is over here on the far right, the average user impact. And that's a percentage that the cost of the query would be reduced according to the query optimizer if it had this index that it's asking for. So higher numbers are more important. The average total user cost is basically how expensive is it to not have this index for whatever query is triggering this. And this just, some, Kimberly Tripp calls these farkles. But supposedly the legend is some developer at Microsoft back in like 1997 had a machine under his desk or her desk, I don't know. But anyways, the point was that how long it took in seconds for the query to run on that machine is what these numbers are based on. But it's just a relative number, so 18 is a lot more expensive than 0 0.03. The next one that's important is the number of user seeks. This is how many times SQL Server has wanted this index. So you'll see here that this one was wanted a lot, but it's not that expensive, whereas this one, fewer times it's wanted it, but it's more expensive. So the overall cost is higher. And then finally, this shows you all the columns that it wants for an index. And when you look at this, a lot of times you'll see that it wants several new indexes on the same table. And a lot of times you can look at that, and rather than having three or four or five new indexes, you can consolidate those into one wider index that covers all of those ones that it's looking for. So these are the kind of things you need to think about. Plus you want to look at your existing indexes and decide what to do. Don't just lose your mind and over-index your table because of this. All right, after that big soapbox talk, we'll go to VLF counts. And VLFs, helps if I highlight the whole thing, VLFs stand for virtual log files. And every time your log file grows, you add a certain number of VLFs. And they changed the formula for this in SQL Server 2014. Paul Randall wrote a blog post that documents that. But what happens quite often is with the default settings when you create a database, you get lots of very small file growths on your log file. And if that happens over time with a runaway transaction log, you'll come in here and find VLF counts in the thousands to tens of thousands range. And you might be thinking, well, who cares? What difference does that make? Well, that tends to hurt write performance of the log file. But more importantly, it takes the recovery portion of a database restore, makes it take a lot longer. So if you're doing a full database restore and you're watching the meter 1%, 2%, 3%, and it gets all the way to 100%, 
that's the restore portion and then after that it has to go through recovery and if you watch that grind away for many 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 minutes afterwards you're probably running into that issue and this also comes into play every time you restart SQL Server all your databases have to go through crash recovery and so you're going through the recovery portion so this makes your instances take longer to start up it also comes into play if you're failing over from one to another in a traditional failover cluster you have to restart SQL Server on the new node and all the databases have to go through crash recovery so this makes your node failovers take longer if you have high VLF counts so the way you fix that is you run a transaction log back up if you're in full recovery model and then shrink the log file and you have to do that several times to get it actually to shrink and then you turn around and grow it in large chunks and you set your auto grow to a large chunk so you don't have this issue with lots and lots of VLFs. All right, the next one in this set is CPU utilization by database. And this shows you which databases are using the most CPU. So if you're under CPU pressure, you can say, hey, wait a minute, this guy is using most of the CPU. Next one does the same thing for I.O. And this is all I.O. against the database. So your regular workload plus backups and index maintenance. So now we see a different database is the major culprit here on my instance. And then finally, another one does the same thing for buffer pool usage. So this shows you which databases are using the most memory in your buffer pool. So this guy is using the vast majority of the memory in the buffer pool, and the rest of them don't have that much. All right. The next one is the infamous uh, cumulative weight stats query. And the reason why I say it's infamous is that so many people misinterpret this or just lose their minds. And so you run this, and it shows you your top cumulative weight types since SQL Server's been running or since somebody manually cleared the weight stats which I with a command that I have commented out at the top there. And this shows you the weight type, and here's the weight percentage, and then here's the average weight seconds broken down by resource weights and signal weights. And the reason why people lose their minds here is, first of all, if, th if things are running really well, don't worry about this that much. SQL Server's always waiting on something. But if you're under performance pressure, then this is more interesting and more useful. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is there's so much bad information on the Internet about what these weight types mean and what, if anything, you should do about them. So don't just do a Google search and then lose your mind and jump to a conclusion and make a change based on the first blog post or forum post that you find. Think about the source of the information. Is it from somebody like Bob Ward or Paul Randall or Microsoft? Or is it just somebody you've never heard of in a forum? And think about what you're doing and do some more analysis before you start changing things. So with all those caveats, looking at this can be useful in pointing you in one direction or another. Is it an I.O. problem? Is it a memory problem? Is it a CPU problem? And so that's what this is really good for. All right. The next one is going to show you how many connections you have by IP address. And so this helps you understand your workload, and this is a normal workload. And since I don't have any remote connections, they're all saying local machine. But in real life, you're going to have probably web servers or application servers that are connecting to your database server. And knowing how many connections they have open is really useful. All right, the next one here is average task counts. And this is really useful. But you've got to run this multiple times and on a regular basis because this will be changing from second to second when you have a workload running. But average task count is basically how busy are your schedulers. And if you see this go above about 10 to 15, quite often that means you've got some pretty severe blocking or deadlock type issues. Or it could just mean that your server is really, really busy and you're maybe under some CPU pressure perhaps. The next one Average runnable task count, if you see this above zero for a sustained period, that's a definite sign of CPU pressure because a runnable task is waiting to get time on a CPU, and you want this to be zero. And the next one, pending disk I.O. count, you want that to be zero. I mean, it's kind of self-explanatory. It means you're waiting for disk time, and so this should be zero. Okay, the next one here. If you are seeing really high average task counts, then this one, if you run it during that period, you might find who the blockers are. This one will tell you when you've got blocking, 
what's being blocked and who's blocking it, and that can be really useful to try to understand what might be going on that's causing your blocking or deadlock type issues. All right. The next one is looking at the ring buffers DMV, and it goes back for 256 minutes to give you your CPU utilization each minute. And so I've been talking for a while here, but if I was to scroll down far enough, I was hitting my thing a little bit to get some CPU utilization by SQL Server. So you can see this for SQL Server itself, and this is for other things that are running on your machine, like PowerPoint in this case, but other things such as virus scanners and system management software and things of that nature, I don't want to see them eating up a whole lot of CPU on my SQL Server instance. So this is nice to go back four hours and see, oh yeah, my processor's been pegged for the last four hours, or no, it just started five minutes ago. Now I know that even if I don't have any kind of monitoring software in place. Okay, so if you are under CPU uh, pressure, you can run this one. This tells you your most expensive worker time queries across your entire instance. It tells you what database they're in and gives you a short query text and some other specs. And I've got two of these co columns commented out since we don't want to see that when we're running this and saving the results in Excel because they're hard to read. But if you uncomment these, you'll get the complete query text plus the query plan. So that can be really useful when you're looking at that. All right, the next one in the set is page life expectancy. And this is going to change from second to second, but you want this to be generally trending upwards. And what you want to do is pay attention to the trend in your normal range. You know, there's some old guidance on the internet about 300 being the threshold. If you're below 300, it's bad. And if you're above 300, it's good. Well, that's obsolete. That was back when servers had a lot less memory. So this depends on your workload and how much memory you have. And just be aware of what your range is rather than saying, okay, it's 500, everything's great. That's not the way you look at this. All right. If you do see signs of memory pressure with sustained low PLE, then this one is the next one you'd be interested in. This is a uh, Perfmon counter, memory grants pending. This will change from second to second. So if you just run it once and it says zero, don't think that everything is great. But if this is ever above zero, that's SQL Server screaming bloody murder that it's under memory pressure. It can't get the memory it needs to run a query, for example. That's a memory grant pending. And that's really, really bad. You don't want, ever want to see that. So again, if you're seeing signs of memory pressure, the next one in the set is going to tell you, OK, who's using all the memory? So you've got different memory clerks. And with SQL Server 2012 or newer, SQL Buffer Pool is the memory clerk you want to use most of your memory. And that's what we're seeing here. But what you'll often see is, well, I don't actually even see it on mine, but there's another one on here. Cache store SQL CP, and those are ad hoc and prepared query plans. And quite often you'll see SQL Server using 4, 6, 8, 12 gigabytes of memory for that to cache ad hoc plans that are very unlikely to be reused. So if you did see that, you can run this query that will find single use ad hoc and prepared query plans that are in the plan cache and show you the query text for them and how much memory they're using and what kind of a plan it is. Now, on a real production server, believe me, you'll see lots of results here. So then you want to go talk to your developers and say, what are you doing? Why are you writing these ad hoc queries? Maybe we can change them into be stored procedures or prepared queries or parameterized queries rather to not uh, have this issue here. And you can also turn on that optimize for ad hoc workloads. And then finally, there's a command right here, DBCC free system cache SQL plans that you can run periodically to flush out that cache. And I've got a lot of customers that do that every few hours. So and you can read a really good article by Kimberly that talks about that right there. So and finally, I want to find out what's going on, who's using all this memory, which queries are using so much memory. So when I run this one, it sorts by total logical read. So this is the short query text for a store procedure in this database that has a lot of logical reads here. So I'd want to look at that and understand why do you have so many logical reads? and What can I do about that? All right, so that's all the instance level queries that can be, you can be connected to the master database like I am now, and that's perfectly fine. But now, these are the database-specific queries. And see how I say use your database name? 
Well, that means switch to the database that you care about. I've had emails saying, I don't have a database called your database name, so your script doesn't work. So hopefully nobody here makes that mistake. So make sure you switch to a database you care about and then run the rest of these queries. So when you run this one, this shows you your individual file sizes for this database and how much space you have available. So you know my log file is very small and I don't have much space, but it tells you what file group they're in and whether or not you're using percent growth or not and what the growth increment is set to. Uh, the next one is going to give me some I.O. statistics by file for this database. And this is really useful to understand your workload. Is it more of an OLTP workload or more of a reporting workload? So it shows you the number of reads for the data file and the number of writes, the number of writes for the log file and the number of reads, and it tells you the megabytes read and written. So this helps you understand how to configure and design your I.O. subsystem and just understand your workload. All right. This shows me my most frequently executed queries for the instance. So that's nice to know. Look for caching opportunities. This does the same thing for store procedures. What store procedures in this database are called the most often and a lot of good specs about them. Now the next several ones here I used to call the bad man queries. And these show you, well this one actually right here is kind of the superhero query. This shows you which store procedures have the highest average elapsed time. And these elapsed times are, are in microseconds, not milliseconds. So this is less than a tenth of a second. But in real life, if you can find something that's taking 30 seconds and do your DBA magic and make it come back in less than a second, people are going to think you're a genius. And if you do that, make sure you let people know what you did because a lot of times your boss has no idea what you do. So going on, this one is going to give me what store procedures have the highest total worker time. So you can see these top three or four are much more expensive than the rest of them. So if I was under CPU pressure and I knew that this database was the source of the CPU pressure, then I know that these three or four queries are the ones that I should look at and start looking at their execution plans and doing some index tuning and query tuning to work on that issue. The next one is the same thing for logical reads. So this shows me which store procedures are most expensive for logical reads, both total and then average. And so this is very useful, again, for finding you're under memory pressure. So I, now I know what store procedures to look at to try to work on the problem. The next one does the same thing for physical reads. So physical reads means you're finding the data in your storage subsystem instead of in your buffer pool, and I don't have any in this case. The next one does the same thing for logical writes. And these last four queries, I called them the bad man queries, and what I meant by that, we would run these and collect the results and send them out to all the developers once a week. So they knew which store procedures they wrote or last worked on, and they didn't want to be at the top of the bad man list. And it was a really good way to get everybody working as a team to improve performance. Now the next one in the set is looking at the top statements by I.O. usage within your store procedures. So I know, I know inside of this store procedure, there's a query right here that generates a lot of I.O. So I don't want to look at that and see what's going on with that. The next one is possible bad non-clustered indexes. By bad, I mean they have more writes than reads. So both of these have quite a few writes and zero reads. But that doesn't mean I just want to drop them. I have to understand how long have I been running and have I seen a complete workload or not. So maybe I can drop those later. So we're getting close to being done. And then this is the missing indexes query that we showed earlier. But this one focuses on this database only. And it also shows you how many rows you have in this table and the table name over here. And this is really important to understand if you're on standard edition. If you're thinking about creating a new index on a really large table in standard edition, you need to think about when you do that because you don't want to do it in the middle of the day and cause a lot of issues. Where with enterprise edition, you can quite often get away with that because you have online index operations. The next one here can take a while to run on a busy instance, but this is looking for missing index warnings in the plant cache. So it shows you, okay, this store procedure has a missing index warning in the query plan, and here's how often it's been called. And if I clicked on this, it would show me the graphical execution plan with the details about the index that SQL Server wants. 
So you can run this one and compare it to what the previous query did and understand which indexes that SQL Server wants are connected to what store procedures. And then I'll help you decide if you want to create them or not. All right, the next one here is showing me what is using all the memory and the buffer pool cache for this database. So this table, the clustered index on it, is using this much space in the buffer pool cache, and I'm not using any data compression on it, where this one is using compression. And these are identical data, and see the difference? Data compression keeps the memory compressed in the buffer pool, which helps reduce your memory pressure. All right, moving on, this gives me some interesting stuff about all my tables in this database. So how many rows, and then whether or not the clustered index or the heap is compressed or not. So when I see a large table that's not using data compression, that's going to pique my interest and I want to look into it to see if maybe I can use data compression, which is, of course is Enterprise Edition only. This gives me some more table properties about all my tables, how many rows are in the table, uh, what's going on with all the indexes and their data compression, and then a bunch of other things about whether it's part of replication or in CDC and things of that nature. All right. The next one is statistics, and so I want to know when were my statistics last updated on this database, and do I have an issue there with stale, stale statistics, and also just some properties about the statistics on my uh, table. All right, next one, what indexes have been modified the most often? Indexes and statistics. This helps you understand your workload and helps you design your I.O. subsystem and think about, you know, doing things like changing your fill factor, for example, making it, making it a lower value to reduce your index maintenance. The next one is fragmentation information for this database. And this will let you see how effective your index maintenance is by looking at your average fragmentation percent. And I've got no fragmentation to speak of here, but a lot of cases that's not the case for people. All right, now I'm going to show my index read write statistics for all of the tables in the database ordered by reads. So these are the most important indexes in terms of my workload. So I've got lots of reads here and not as many writes. So these are really useful for me. So that's good to understand that. And then the next one does the same thing, ordered by writes. So when I run that, this will show me the indexes that have the most writes. And what I'm looking for here are, again, indexes that have lots of writes and no reads. Because if this goes on over time, it turns out this index is not helping me at all, and I might want to drop that after I look into it and figure out if maybe it's used by some report that's only run once a month, for example. All right, if I was using Hecaton in memory OLTP, this would show me my index usage by Hecaton because the other stuff we just did does not show Hecaton usage. And then this is going to show me my lock weights. So if I'm seeing blocking and deadlock type issues, this will point me at the tables and indexes that have the highest amount of lock weights. So maybe there's an issue there where I'm missing an index that's causing SQL Server to do a clustered index scan that's causing lots of locking problems. And this would help figure that out in some cases. And then finally, we get to the last query in the set, and this is my recent full backups for this database with all the statistics about how big it was and what my backup compression ratio was, how long it took, whether or not it has a backup checksums, which are a really good idea. Is it a copy-only backup? Is it an encrypted backup? And then how long it took. So that's the complete set. And I've got links, again, to my Pluralsight courses, which you can listen to for free if you send an email to Paul that go into more detail about all these queries and, and explain how they work. So I rushed through that. So if we have any time left, I can take questions, Carlos. Okay, Glenn. Uh, thanks a lot, by the way. Uh, that was uh, a lot a lot of really good information in a short amount of time. So I think it's uh, based on the comments I'm hearing, it was really well received as well. So, um, you know, the first thing people ask is, uh, is the session going to be recorded? And it is. Uh, Unfortunately, I messed up a little bit, and so I chopped off the intro, my intro, and then probably the first 90 seconds of what Glenn said, but uh, the rest of the session will be there. So we'll upload it to the, uh, to the website, to the past website, uh, within, within a few days at the latest. Um, uh, you know, another question is, uh, Glenn, is people ask about the scripts and some of the links you had early on. And could you 
could you put those uh, screens up again so we catch them in the recording and also leave them up there because I think you went through them kind of quick and people wanted to write them down or something. So people want to know where they can get the scripts. People want to kind of see the links you had again and that sort of thing. Okay. <clears throat> well, the easiest way to find these scripts is just Google Glenn Berry DMV and it'll take you to my blog on SQL skills and that's because I update them every month. So that's how you find them really easily. Okay, and, and I was going to say the same thing. You know, if there's a question here I don't get to, Glenn is a big blogger and very available out there in the, in the social world. Uh, so, so if you, you have a question, you can always go to his blog and, and comment or, or ask or, or that sort of thing uh, as well if, if something wasn't covered here or if we didn't get to anything. Um, let's see, there was a lot of questions kind of all over the place. So, uh, so maybe I'll just start with a couple and um, uh, let you, um, some, one person asked about trace flag 4199 and was just wondering if it was still relevant. I don't remember if that's one of the trace flags you actually showed on the screen there. Well, I didn't show that. I mean, what that one does is Microsoft makes changes that typically affect performance or the behavior of SQL Server. And in the past, you wouldn't get those unless you use 4199 on older versions of SQL Server. But on 2016, that's going to be, that effect is going to be enabled by default. So that's kind of what's going on with that. Uh, I've got a link that talks about that here in the script. But yeah, I don't have that turned on by default on 2014. But there are certain cases where you might want to do that. And it's going to be on by default in 2016. Okay, thanks, Glenn. Um, let's see, somebody was asking about um, a buffer pull extension, and is it available in SQL 2012, I guess, would be the next question. Uh, no, it came out in 2014, and they surprised us and actually put it in Standard Edition, which is good, because that's really the only place where I would want to use it is in Standard Edition, because Standard Edition has that low memory limit of 128 gigabytes. So it can be pretty useful to help with that. Okay. Another question is, um, I'll just read the question to you. On your site, I see that you have XLS templates for the output. Is there a way to run all the scripts and export the results to Excel, XLS? Uh, not by me, but there's several people that I know of out in the community who have done things with PowerShell. And I know one person did something with C Sharp. And so the idea would be that, you know, you get a hold of one of those other solutions and then you run it pointing at my script and it'll spit out the information and save it in Excel, for example. What I do when I run this personally, and I know this wouldn't be practical for some people because you've got hundreds of instances, but I run these manually and copy and paste the results into Excel. And that's what I have on my site are a blank spreadsheet where the tabs are labeled to match the query names. So core counts is one tab. And so I do that on purpose manually because as I'm running the queries, I'm looking at the results and thinking about it and marking up the spreadsheet with color codes and notes. So when I'm done, I have a pretty good picture of what's going on with that server. But I know that if you've got 100 servers, you might not have time to do that and you just want to push a button and have it done. But you still got to look at it and analyze it. So at some point, you need to do that one way or another. Another question, Glenn, was um, what's your general approach, maybe you can speak to this, for uh, doing analysis across multiple instances and multiple databases? Well, I mean, you know, I, as a consultant, I get called in to look at people's machines and instances pretty often. So I typically, seriously, well, I'll run this set of scripts or else get them to run it and save the results for me. And then I just start looking at what's going on here. And these are organized on purpose a certain way so I can kind of see what's going on with SQL Server and then the OS and the hardware and the storage subsystems. So all that is instance level and machine level to a certain extent. And then usually after you've done that, you can zero in on one or two databases that are causing the most issues and run the database portion against those. Of course, if you've got hundreds of databases on an instance, it becomes a little more interesting to run the database level stuff. But usually, you've just got a few databases that are causing most of the pain, and you can focus on those. 
Somebody was asking for you to scroll down. I think you might have already scrolled down. Or are there more links actually below there? Uh, just to see no or I think they just couldn't well, see all your links. Well, I mean I've got links all over the place. I mean yeah. here's my blog on SQL okay. skills and that's, that's something my somebody handle. else was asking too is wanting to see your blog. So good you showed that again. Yeah. And again, Google will find me, and then I'm on Twitter. Yeah, that, Twitter's a good resource, by the way, for SQL Server. Yeah, Glenn is very uh, visible out there. So, um, so please, uh, please, if we didn't uh, ask any questions, you, one of the questions you you had, there were a lot of questions that came in, and there were actually quite a bit. You know, they were all over the place. So some of them were more troubleshooting type questions, but um, uh, which I think this session was just trying to show you how to gather the data and, and visualize it. Um, so what I'll do since we're at the end of the session here, I'll cut it off here. Like I said, and, and Glenn said it, he's very available out there on the internet, easy to find. Um, please follow up with him if we didn't cover anything. Uh, I want to thank you very much, Glenn. This was a great session, a lot of information. It's exactly the kind of session we look for here in the performance group, so I appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me, Carlos. And again, send me an email, Glenn, at SQL Skills, if you have a question that I didn't answer, and I'll definitely answer it for you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Glenn, and, and have a good afternoon. All right, thanks, Carlos.